So I told you that AQ is a symbol for an aqueous solution. I need to talk a little bit about what that is. An aqueous solution is a homogeneous mixture of some substance with water. Oftentimes this is an ionic compound. When ionic compounds dissolve in water, they usually separate or dissociate into their component ions. So you can form an aqueous solution of sodium chloride by stirring some table salt into a glass of water. The salt seems to disappear. You add the solid and you stir it around and it's like, where did it go? You can't see it anymore. It's different than if you took a teaspoon of sand and put it into water. You stir that around and you can still see the sand, right? It's going to fall to the bottom. It's going to sit there like lumps, right? That's what sand does. The salt dissolves. It seems to disappear, but it's still there. If you taste it, you'll know, oh, yeah, there's salt in there. What's happening when sodium chloride dissolves in water? The sodium ions and the chloride ions separate from each other. They don't stay together as sodium chloride units because there aren't any molecules in ionic compounds. There are just ions, and when they dissolve in water, they separate. So substances like this that completely separate into ions are called strong electrolytes. You've probably heard the, the word electrolyte in terms of fitness and staying hydrated and stuff. Your body needs certain levels of sodium and potassium and chloride and other ions in order to function. When you sweat profusely, you excrete a lot of salt as well. That's why, you know, sometimes you sweat a lot and you look at your shirt later and it's got like this white crusty stuff. What is that? Well, that's salt that you sweated out. If that isn't replaced, then you can get into trouble. You can have heart arrhythmia and you could even die. So electrolytes are what replenish that. They are dissolved ionic substances. Why do we call them electrolytes? Well, pure water doesn't collect, conduct electricity. If you hook up a battery to a light bulb and instead of touching the two ends of these wires together, you stick them in pure water, the light bulb doesn't light up because pure water does not conduct electricity. If you throw some salt in the water, then the light bulb lights up because in order for the light bulb to light up, we have to have a closed circuit, a continuous loop for the electrons to move in. Pure water does not allow electrons to jump from one electrode to the next. But in a sodium chloride solution, these charged particles, the ions, can transport the electrons and allow electricity to flow. So it's called a strong electrolyte because when you use a conductivity apparatus like this, the light bulb is, the light is strong. If we look at silver nitrate, silver nitrate is also an ionic compound. When silver nitrate dissolves in water, it separates into silver ions and nitrate ions. These are polyatomic ions. They behave as a unit, so those don't separate at all. There are two ions, the silver ions and the nitrate ions. This is also a strong electrolyte solution. There's lots of ions here. And if you put the conductivity apparatus in there, the light bulb will glow brightly, strongly. So polyatomic ions stay together when they're dissolved in water. Yes? How else would you see them act as conductors? Oh, that's a tough question. How else would they, would you see them act as conductors? Well, I mean, if you... We're standing in a puddle of salt water holding an electrical cord. You could probably get a nasty shock. Yeah. So this brings up a question. You've probably heard that you shouldn't do stuff with electricity while standing in water, right? But I just said pure water doesn't conduct electricity. Pure water. If you're standing in a puddle on your patio, is that pure water? Is that distilled water? No. So that's slightly different. I'll get to that in a minute. So the reason that water 
in our everyday lives can be hazardous is because there are dissolved solids in there. Hard water contains ions that can conduct electricity. So it really depends on the water, right? So can you get electrocuted if your radio falls into your bathtub? I think Mythbusters did an episode on that one. Um, is it possible? Yes. Uh, is it going to kill you? Uh, I don't know. It, it kind of depends. Um, if you have bath salts in there, if your water's really salty, it's going to be worse than if it's just plain water. Um, but there's a lot of factors that go into that. Are you going to get a nasty shock? At the very least, yes, a nasty shock. If, if the electricity, electricity is complicated, there's voltage, right? So a 9-volt battery, you stick your tongue on it, you're going to get zapped, right? There's a, a small voltage. Well, if you stick your tongue across a plugged-in, don't do this. A, a, an extension cord that's plugged into the wall, and you stick your tongue across the end of that. That's going to hurt a lot more. I really, really don't do that. Why? Because it's 120 volts. It's not 9 volts. Your car has 12 volts. And so dealing with that battery is much more dangerous. So it has also to do with how much electricity there is. Lightning, huge voltage. Lightning will zap anything, even water. It, it decomposes the water, actually, when it does that. Does does every ionic compound dissolve in water? No. Sodium chloride doesn't. I'm sorry, silver. Silver chloride doesn't. They both start with us. Silver chloride doesn't, doesn't dissolve. You're like, well, why not? The sodium chloride did. What's special about silver chloride? It's complicated why some ionic compounds dissolve and others don't. But sodium, silver chloride will just sit there as a lump. It will not separate into ions. So this is not going to conduct electricity because there's no ions here. So this would be a non-electrolyte. How do we tell if something will dissolve or not? Well, we use the word soluble. A compound is soluble in a liquid if it will dissolve in that liquid. We're really just going to talk about things dissolving in water. If it doesn't dissolve, it's considered insoluble, not soluble. For ionic compounds, we, we make use of a set of empirical rules of solubility. And so these are observation. People would take sodium chloride and put some in water and stir it up. Oh, that dissolved. Okay, let's try silver chloride. Put, put some in water, stir it up. Nope, that doesn't dissolve. Basically, it was that. Just try stuff. See what dissolves. Lots and lots of people did it, and they came up with these patterns. The solubility rules are summarized in Table 7.2. They are general rules. There are exceptions. So here's the table. I am not going to make you memorize this. OK? I will give you this table on exam two or any exam where you need it. And you need to know how to use the table. This table is slightly different than the one on the back of the, I think it's the green, yeah, the green card that you guys like so much. Um, this one's a little bit different, and I really would encourage you to use this one instead of the one on the green card, because I think this one is more straightforward, and it does what we need it to do. So in the top part of this table, these are compounds that are mostly soluble. So if it's got lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium ion, it's going to be soluble unless, oh, there's no exceptions. Anything. Any, any, cation, any anion with one of these cations is soluble. If it's got nitrate ion or acetate ion, it's soluble, no exceptions. The halides, chloride, bromide, iodide, those are usually soluble except with silver. Silver chloride isn't soluble. Silver bromide's not soluble. Silver iodide isn't soluble. Mercury 1, Hg2, 2 plus, we won't run into that one very much, or lead 2, those then it's not soluble. Sulfate compounds are usually soluble except with strontium, barium, lead-2, or calcium. Then it's not soluble. The bottom half is sort of the reverse. Compounds containing these ions are usually not soluble except. So hydroxide and sulfide, 
Those are not soluble except, so when either of these pairs with one of those. Well, I would recommend going through this table in order. If you, if you have, say, lithium hydroxide, you come here, you see it's got lithium in it, no exceptions, you say it's soluble, you're done. You're never going to get down here to see that exception. So those are an exception because of this rule up here. Um, sulfide with calcium, strontium, or barium is, in, is soluble. That's an exception. Hydroxide with calcium, strontium, or barium, this is slightly soluble. So that one gets a little bit tricky. Um, for many purposes, that can be considered insoluble, but sometimes it's considered soluble. I'm sorry. It's, that's how it is. Then carbonate and phosphate. Those are insoluble unless they're paired with one of these. Again, if you had, say, sodium carbonate, and you were trying to evaluate whether it's soluble or not, You'd see the sodium, you'd say it's soluble, and you wouldn't ever get down here to see the exceptions. So let's, let's practice this. Is each compound soluble or insoluble? So here we have CUS. Well, we've got to look at the table here. So we've got copper and sulfide. So we look through here. We don't see anything. We don't see anything. Oh, here, S2 minus. That's one of the ions. So Mostly insoluble, except, so now we go over here to the exceptions, and we're looking for copper. Copper's not in there. So copper sulfide is what? Insoluble. Oops, how did I do that? So that would be insoluble. Iron 2 sulfate. Again, we've got to look at the table. Start at the top. Do we see iron? No. Sulfate? No. Here's sulfate. Sulfate is mostly soluble, except iron is not one of the exceptions. So that means that iron sulfate is soluble. But it doesn't have the charge. But it doesn't have the charge. Okay. Well, let's look at this. All right? What are the two ions in that compound? iron and sulfate. So we know that sulfate is SO4 2 minus. Uh, we couldn't tell the charge on this based on position in the periodic table, but because there's one of each, we know that this is 2 plus. Okay, so this is iron 2 ions and sulfate ions. Okay, so this one's soluble. Um, this would be lead 2 carbonate. So this contains lead 2 ions and carbonate ions. We, we look at the PB, that's the first ion, and we cover that up. Everything else is part of the second ion. There's only two ions. So then we go back to the uh, table. We're looking for lead 2 and carbonate. We go through here, nothing, 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 nothing. Oh, there's carbonate. Mostly insoluble, except lead is not one of the exceptions. So lead carbonate must be insoluble. Ammonium chloride. Oh, look, here's ammonium. Ammonium compounds are mostly soluble, no exception. So that one's soluble. Yeah, the, the first one you come to. Because um, chloride is in the table also. So if we kept going, um, we would see that chloride compounds are mostly soluble except with these things. Ammonia is not, ammonium is not one of those, right? What if you had carbonite or sulfite or variation of carbonite? 
That's a good question. What if you had carbonite or sulfite or phosphite or one of those other ones? We're not going to ask you to do that in Chem 3A. How's that? You just, we'll only ask you things on, on tests or homework that have to do with what's on this table. Now, the worksheets are sometimes something else. The worksheet, some of those questions are bears. I mean, they're just really hard. Um, so just give it your best shot and don't freak out about anything on a worksheet.